Thanks, Laura. Um, am I supposed to keep time, or is someone else keeping time? Um, John. Time. Wonderful. Fantastic. Oh, fantastic. So um, we had a phone conference about a week ago to discuss some of the potential topics for discussion. In your uh, materials, there are some draft questions as well for session one, and these are some that are a little bit um, um, beyond that. Uh, we've heard uh, a few times this morning uh, the question raised whether genotyping should come before the phenotyping, whether before patients are seen at a center, it would be useful to get whole exome or whole, whole genome sequencing done first prior to their visit. I think that's a, a major topic to discuss and may depend very much on what the goals are at the time. We've heard that about half of the diagnoses are genetic and we've heard about half of the diagnoses are not based on genetics even though they're probably all genetic disorders, um, you could, you know, that's half full or half empty, I guess, depending on your perspective. Um, I think an overarching question I had as I first got involved in, in um, well, learning about the network and, um, and thinking about some of these things is, who's the, who's the network for? Is this for patients? Is it for scientists? I think the answer, obviously, is it's for both. But how do you balance the uh, scientific goals, which is often discovery, almost always, with the, uh, the needs of the, the patients and, the, and often their local clinicians who are uh, looking for guidance? Um, and then a third one was, is really, you know, what, are, what is the feasibility to having a standard approach to deep uh, really deep and comprehensive phenotyping across clinical sites, across clinical specialties even, um, and, uh, and back to this question of whether having certain sites in the network have specific areas of clinical expertise or whether uh, it's best to, to really be able to provide a, a comprehensive evaluation. Um, so let me um, open that up to, uh, to discussion. And I can't see everybody's name, so I'm going to point and nod. So Sue Berry from Minneapolis. Um, so one of the things increasingly in clinical genetics that is emerging is a lot of us are taking the approach of starting out by looking carefully as much as we're smart enough to do to figure out a handful of specific genes to look at. And once we get past those, people are saying, oh, screw it. Do an exome. And so increasingly, I think you're going to find that people are going to come to you with exomes completed and possibly negative. How are you going to incorporate that data? Because you're going to need to. It'll probably have to be reinterrogated because maybe it wasn't analyzed with the act, well, whatever we call now accuracy that will be required to ultimately define this. And how do we, how do we, because this, what you're going to have is a combination of clinically accessed um, standard clinical activity that's going to come to you before you even see the patient. Because after, after we get an exome and we got nothing, then we're kind of stymied. So what do you think about that, guys? Yep. Yeah. Rachel Ramoni uh, from the Coordinating Center. So we have even in the early days had an experience of, of a previous exome um, being brought in, and those those are reanalyzed typically. And in fact, in one case, um, they found what they believe to be a, an entirely novel diagnosis on the basis of that um, of that reanalysis. But you're going to have to have a systematic way to do that because increasingly, that's something you're going to get from the beginning. Uh, yes. So those typically are being done at the clinical sites, um, uh, and so each site has its own means has its own pipeline. So there, there will be some variability in how they are analyzed, but we hope also that the variability can be leveraged. There's even talk in the network of sites taking, you know, taking an individual um, exome or genome and analyzing it through their, through their own pipelines if, if, for instance, at first it comes up negative at, at one site. So I think, um, you know, clinical utility and clinical exomes are going to focus on known genes and disease variants. I think um, it's, uh, and, and at Baylor we've had the experience where when those exomes are moved to a research setting, you increase the yield, not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the bottom line is that um, it's a 
continuity and a continuous process. There isn't, it's, it's not really, um, you know, a binary decision. And um, really at the end of the day, uh, my, my sense is we should focus on what is most effective and efficient for the patient. Um, you know, in the optimal world, you would have an exome that's done clinically or, and then uh, research interpretation and then you bring the patient in. But uh, I just think that, you know, at the end of the day of, of integrating clinical practice into research, you have to be practical and it's going to be context dependent. So as I was sitting and listening to the, the, the discussion and presentation earlier today, I kept thinking, is there a difference between unknown diseases and undiagnosed diseases, meaning uh, these are entities that, that we or certain individuals with specific expertise know exist, and it just takes putting the right information together to make the diagnosis, as opposed to, as, we've, as we well know, the monthly or weekly new disease-relevant uh, mutations or new disease-relevant genes that are being uh, described. And it seems to me that there might be a difference uh, in how to approach those based on what the, uh, what the prior um, uh, suspicion is of, of different entities. So Howard Jacob from uh, Hudson Alpha. Um, so I want to come back to, to the question about um, the exomes and I think one of the challenges you're going to find is it's not so much on the technical side of sequencing the genome, whether it's exome or whole genome or the analysis, but it's going to be the comfort level of the physician on being able to make the call. So it's the classic N of 1. And so obviously if the variant's been known to cause disease before, um, it's much easier. But I see a huge range in, in a physician's boundaries, if you will, of will, there, will they'll make a call. Some will use model organism databases, data, some won't. Some want to have uh, ACMG guidelines before they'll make a call. Others will go into the research. And I think one of the big challenges is more on the clinical side than it is on the technical side of reading the genome and doing the analysis. So I think one of the other things that, that is striking um, is just how much pleiotropy there is and that there are, uh, you know, genes that many of us associated with a specific disease where we now know that, well, maybe there are 10 or 15 major phenotypes that are different that can uh, result from that. And then on the other side, of course, the heterogeneity. And so, again, it, it may depend very much on what the, what the history is of this individual patient, whether the first approach should be more careful phenotyping to guide evaluation versus a, a broader brush. You know, I was going to say just along the same lines that we all we talk a lot about uh, best practices. For this particular point, of genotype first versus phenotype first, there's certainly no best practices, and that might be that could be a goal of the UDN. Within the UDN, I know that there are widely different approaches. Some sites do phenotype first. Uh, we, we at UCLA do the exact, we, we do the exact opposite. We don't, the patient doesn't set foot at UCLA without uh, a, a genotype with a whole genome or whole exome and uh, that, that um, has been interpreted maybe on a what you mean, Brendan, I think by research level, it was sort of like lower a little bit the, the threshold of potential variants to be explored to phenotype because we think that one of the practical issues is whether the deep phenotype, if it's going to be the same for everyone, then of course it doesn't need to be guided by a genotypic investigation. But the question is, is deep phenotyping for absolutely everything at every single, uh, you know, organ, is it, is it practically feasible in, in, in uh, sort of the real world of, of managed care. I'm not sure about that. This probably is a bit heretical, but if 75 percent haven't been found when DNA has been done, um, we, we're all geneticists, so we know there's genetic modification. But my question really is aimed at um, there must be other things like exposures to toxins, the natural history, something happened in childhood. Um, that is actually what's going on, uh, travel so that you were exposed to bugs. And my question is really how much of that kind of data is part of the standard workup so that if somebody had um, grown up in Africa, you would know it and that would be um, 
directing you to think about their genetic interaction when in the African either environment or um, infectious disease? So that's a good question. I think, um, you know, certainly we've had some consideration that I think uh, Dr. Lee's case of earlier today, I, my view of that as a non-geneticist was, boy, that was a situation where really the, the phenotype and the history really led uh, what, um, what ultimately was a, a genetic probable answer. Um, there are certainly things that can be sent through the mail. There are certainly things that can be shipped uh, electronically. One thing that can't be shipped electronically is the patient. And there are some things. So as a neurologist, I know there are certain things that can be done as physiologic measures that may be only one or two places in the country have the expertise to do it, but can be the essential diagnostic test uh, to, to make a diagnosis or to help interpret uh, genetic testing. So, so that's the thing that you really can't do is the, is the physiology. So I'm suggesting, though, there will be pieces in the history. Um, the best source of history is grandma. Mm -hmm. And my guess is grandma doesn't come very often, um, but grandma remembers that something or other happened. And, and I, I think as we move forward, we're going to be really wishing we had more early childhood information or mm -hmm. exposures that that was a really dirty plant in the, you know, whatever. There is a, oh. I was going to say, there is a detailed exposure uh, questionnaire as part of the, the network. Two questions now. Um, one is that as people will come with genomes, sometimes they have what looks like it could have be a causative variant, but the clinician is really not in a position to explore that further. Is that the kind of case that might well be almost a shortcut to um, directing information about, um, about learning about that case? Um, and then the second question is how are we or how does, how does the network proposed to think about epigenetic variants that will impact uh, phenotype. Anyone want to take a stab at addressing those? Well, I can talk about the, the, the first case. We have seen cases where the diagnosis was already made, but the referring physician didn't sort of accept that diagnosis mm -hmm. because, as you said, there's pleiotropy. So specifically, um, <clears throat> uh, a really good gene variant was found and was reported as a variant of unknown significance because even though it was deleterious, it was, um, didn't fit into the clinical phenotype. And it turns out that all the clinical phenotypes associated with that gene were um, loss of function and this was a gain of function, or at least, you know, we're pretty sure of that. <laughs> so that'll happen a lot of times, and I think those are suitable candidates for us to pursue because we really can't expect referring physicians around the country to know about those research aspects of it or the, or, or the you know, the variability or the, the uh, potential pleiotropy because it hasn't been defined yet. But as far as the uh, epigenetic stuff, someone else can take that. Where do the, um, where do the UDP patients come from? Are most of them within a, a convenient drive to a tertiary uh, uh, or research medical center, or do most of them come from uh, more uh, rural areas or outlying areas? So they come from all over the world, but actually, if they're in a rural area, they're less likely to have had a tertiary care workup, yeah. which is required f for mm -hmm. us to accept the patient, you know, having eliminated all the other stuff. I would say about a third to maybe even a half of our patients have been to one of the major medical centers, um, such as the Mayo Clinic or mm -hmm. Hopkins or Cleveland Clinic or Harvard or Stanford or, you know, one of those Baylor places, t type places. Actually, probably a half, maybe even two-thirds. Other comments or, or discussion? Yes. Good way of tapping in into that population for the future the population that hasn't been assessed at this point. So there has to be another pathway created to give patients the access. Sure. Whose responsibility is that? <coughs> government. Well, okay. So I'm hired by the government. 
Wendy. I think what she's sort of talking about is the justice issue, and 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 this this is there's two elements to this. One of them is the science, which is incredible, but the other one is access to care, which is obviously um, skewed in this setting. If only half of the diagnoses are coming from genetics, what are the other half coming from? And do you have a way of knowing which ones are going to be which so you know who to genotype first and then bring in versus, you know, do the whole workup? I, I just have to say that half of the diagnoses are not made from genetics. It's much more than that. What I said was that half of our diagnoses are made without using next generation sequencing. Ah, okay. So a, a lot of these are like commercial stuff or get an enzyme assay or say, things of that sort. But I think that probably 90 percent of our cases are known to be genetic. And as you said, perhaps 100 percent of, of all cases are genetic. I suppose some trauma is not, but nonetheless. I mean, it seems to me if it's 90 percent plus that are genetic, why wouldn't you get the genetics first and to lead, lead your phenotype? And if I might answer, the reason is that some of our patients who come to us at the NIH we don't get any genetics on because they don't, uh, they, they don't have objective findings. We sometimes make mistakes like that, not very often anymore. But we, or sometimes we can look at the patient and do a phenotype and uh, phenotypic analysis and make the diagnosis without any genetics at all. And that means that we're wasting exomes and genomes beforehand, which subsequently have a responsibility associated with them. You know, incidental, secondary findings, getting back to the patient, tell me what the results were, et cetera. And, and so it creates uh, an additional burden. So I would, I believe that really our phenotyping should dictate and guide our uh, genotype analysis rather than having our genotype analysis of, uh, basically guide a phenotype. I mean, why would you alter your phenotype incredibly much? Yeah, because when you do an examination of a patient and have all your consultants around, it's important to find out things and ask the same questions of one patient that you would of another. Not, you know, not completely, but to be thorough enough to look for things that you might not have thought of uh, based upon a genotype. But just to push a bit more, I mean, if you figured out either the cost, the time, or the burden on the family to do this very wide phenotyping and what the yield is, have you done that type of analysis to know that versus taking a very targeted approach, which might be even deeper in a specific dimension if you were guided by the genes? No, that type of analysis we haven't spent the time on. I would just follow up on the last comment, though. I think in terms of you know, the long-term goals and the data generated by the UDN, um, identifying a gene before a patient's seen is very satisfying from the standpoint of the family. You don't have to travel, et cetera. But in terms of generating deep phenotype data and linking that to genetic data, linking that to other data, and, and expanding the ongoing development of the you know, bioinformatic tools for future, you know, you lose that if you don't do the process. And just back to the idea of pleiotropy, too, or uh, off-target effects that, you know, having the genotype alone may tell you very little about what is causing disability or what, you know, what symptoms are, are um, worth focusing on treating as opposed to, you know, you have uh, ABCXYZ32, which means almost nothing to, to patients. And so it's in the, that conversation based on the phenotype, I think that very often is the most useful information for, for, uh, for the patients. Yeah. So I'm going to take a stab at your question about epigenetics. Okay. I, I definitely believe that, I think whether there's data or not, we all believe that epigenetics will explain a, a component of the missing heritability that we see. And I think that the UDN is a perfect um, venue to begin to explore this in terms of, of clinical application because you have deep phenotyping information. We have deep genomic information. And so, I mean, for example, I mentioned we were doing RNA-seq. Part of the reason for that is, you know, to ask the question um, globally in blood, do you see evidence of altered expression mm -hmm. in the transcriptome, which you could relate back to not just the primary genomic defect if you had a gene candidate that was expressed, but really also, in fact, an epigenetic alteration if you didn't have a structural or, you know, a mutation. 
So I do think this is exactly a question that we need to be tackling in the mm -hmm. future because that's the next stage of clinical diagnosis. Time for one more. Yep. So I wanted to get back at the earlier question about diversity in UDN. And so, uh, so one way to do that, I think, and what the model we are trying to follow in Tennessee uh, is actually provide phone-directed uh, consultation. So because of uh, the way we have advertised UDN services in Tennessee, we will occasionally get uh, physicians calling us from rural communities who have a patient and they want to know uh, based on the presentation uh, that patient may have or has whether that patient is suitable for UDN. And we can give them a good idea about or advice about, hey, this is what you have to do. You're close to Memphis. Go to uh, and we have contacts, you can go and talk to this physician, and this is the pathway to starting a, a sort of baseline workup. So I think that is probably one of the ways that we can uh, help a lot more pa patients. And the follow-up to that is that we ne all sites or the, one, the sites that are going to be doing this, they need to have a metric and record this, because I think this is an important point, that not only that UDN saw X number of patients in their site, but they actually helped guide through a physician or a subspecialist in another medical center care that actually helped that patient. Okay, so um, our time is up. Let me just take a couple minutes to uh, to summarize. Um, I'll leave I'll leave this up. I think um, certainly this issue of genotype first versus uh, phenotyping first. Probably there is no right answer, um, and I think depending on who's doing it, one approach may be more efficient than the other, but I think that is something for, for discussion f going forward. I think that the, the main um, importance, I think, of, of having a network like this is, is to make sure that all of that information is captured so that, as was mentioned, you know, if you have a genotypic answer before you see the patient, that may minimize the amount of, uh, of useful phenotypic information that is, uh, that is gotten. Um, but certainly um, uh, other ideas, you know, for future areas of emphasis, I do think certainly um, ways of looking at um, environmental uh, early, early life history elements and potential interactions um, will be uh, important. And then the last question on the slide I think is still one that, that we didn't discuss very much, but one going forward, the question will be, should there be a reasonably, at least a, a kind of a minimum core um, data set that should be obtained for patients with certain types of complaints across the network so that if you are seen at a UDN site, um, should it be, you know, really expected you will get a completely different kind of evaluation depending what sites you go to, perhaps based on what their expertise is, or, or should this be something where there needs to be some at least minimum level of uniformity of what type of phenotypic data are collected and in what way they're collected. But I think that's, that's a, a very good, I think, future question. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. So we now have a break scheduled for 15 minutes. For those of you who are seeking caffeine, there is a snack shop off the lobby that probably will be able to provide some for you. And we are due back at 10.20, and then we'll have questions two, three, and four before we break for lunch. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>